So we've been talking about some of the insights that we feel we've gathered from pulling together some of these large-scale research infrastructure projects and initiatives that are a part of the Parthenos cluster. And we've talked a bit about engaging with your users and communicating, but I also want to have a word about the macro level, uh, because again, the difference with infrastructure is one of scale. And once you start developing at scale, that has a, an impact on what you want to bring up from the bottom. But it's also going to have an impact on what comes down from the top. The visibility and the impact that you're having will also have an effect on the way you can and must, I would say, operate. So this is an image that uh, I, I, I pulled together um, after a talk by the Parthenos coordinator, Franco Nicolucci. And he said that, you know, our view of research infrastructures is, is experiment-based and laboratory-based. And he really says, he, you need to think of infrastructures as a bridge, and the road is like a tool, and the bicycle is like a service. And you have the whole thing together creates a facility. And all of that together is going to help you get from one side of the river to the other. But that, of course, plays into this question of, well, what are the assets of an infrastructure? We said earlier, an infrastructure is like an elephant. It's going to be different depending on your perspective, how you approach it, how you come to it. And so if you think of an infrastructure as made up of knowledge, of services or tools, of data, and also of people, and all of that together is your facility, then in each one of those quadrants, you're going to have different tasks, you're going to have different responsibilities. So in terms of the knowledge, you're going to need to share that, to train, to mentor, to push that out. Uh, in terms of the data, you're going to need to curate, to prepare, to federate. There's a huge number of activities there. In terms of the services, in terms of the software, you'll be providing it, but also adapting it, creating it, migrating it, maintaining it. And then finally, in, the, in that last quadrant, you'll again have this question of introducing, inspiring, bringing the people together to create the network. And all of that is going to be facilitated by the central mission to facilitate reuse, to bring things to scale, to support hybridity, and to be durable. So all of that comes together. And I suppose in trying to think about how to view all this coming together. It really depends on who you are. And this is where I want to break down the blind man, not the elephant. Because who you come to the research infrastructure as will determine, to a large extent, what kinds of questions you may ask. Um, so the different categories of people, so we talk about end users, the researchers, we talk about um, cultural heritage, and we talk about developers. Um, but we also need to think about people as being on, a, on almost a kind of a stair-step ladder of expertise. So you may have the kind of the users might be at a bo the bottom, so people who are just kind of using the tools of the infrastructure. And then somewhere in the middle you may have people who are contributing to it. And then at the top you have people who are creating and imagining these infrastructures. So let's look a little bit at these roles. The user needs to get past the chicken and egg problem. The user needs to get past the question of, well, uh, how do I know what to use it for? How do I know what it does if I don't know it exists? So you really have to get underneath the skin of, of the infrastructure before you can approach it. So knowing what a research infrastructure is, knowing how to access it, knowing what the services are, and knowing what it can do for you and what you can learn from it and through it, that's what the users will be looking for. And so at that level, pushing that kind of broad message out, again, in terms of the kind of communication strategies we talked about in the other lecture, um, is quite important. Once you come to the contributor level, these are going to be people who don't need to know what the research infrastructure is, but they want to know how they can use it better how they can reuse and build sustainably to be a part of it, how they can incorporate their users, their data, their audiences to be more effective in their own work, uh, and how they can use the research infrastructure to connect with a community that may have similar goals and useful knowledge. How can the research infrastructure facilitate my own networking, and how can I be a part of their networks? Finally, at that top level, and this is the level where I assume many of you will see yourselves if you're watching this video, um, you want to be thinking about providing that layer, that support layer at scale. 
Again, it's about bringing the bottom up. Um, how you can deepen your understanding of users and stakeholders and audiences, knowing what the balance is between those four quadrants. How much data? How much knowledge? How much networking? Where are you going to put the emphasis and where are you going to put the resources and the investment to get the maximal value into your user community and out of the infrastructure? Um, how you can reuse the work of others, how you can ensure sustainability and interoperability, where you can find peers and information, and most importantly, how you can shape the environment around you. Once an infrastructure gets to scale, it actually becomes like a little galaxy. It has gravity working within it, and you want to use that for your users and for your infrastructure. However, once you get to the point where you are developing this gravity and this pull, you also need to be aware, I think, of some of the concerns that exist and some of the, what I would say, almost responsibilities that exist um, in the development of these kinds of scale um, developments. <clears throat> so because infrastructure has a tendency to consolidate, it consolidates access to funding, it consolidates power to a certain extent, it consolidates messages. And this is very powerful, this is great in some ways, it allows and enables many things, but it also exacerbates some of the known sources of friction we already have talked about and written about in digital humanities. It can create perverse incentives. It can be seen as a place for exacerbating gender inequality. It can be seen as a place where post-colonial divides and the divides between the North and the South start to become more evident. And it can also be a place where you see um, fissures in labor relations. And again, I think the, uh, the, the references here are all in the, the text. So I would encourage you, if any of these issues are of interest or of concern to you, to take a look into those. And I do want to come back to that labor relations question in just a minute. But before we talk about that, just the other uh, issue I want to spend some time on is this question of macro-level policy. Because certainly in Europe, Infrastructures are being seen as intermediaries and important players in the development of the open science policy initiatives. But within an infrastructure, we can't mandate what the institutions we bring together value. We can't mandate what the collection holding institutions that we work with will allow us to share. And we can't always serve researchers and citizens when we're only given a limited bu budget and a narrow remit. So these two issues, the open science policy and the careers actually are two that I find are very, very big and quite unresolved in the infrastructure community right now. So a couple of words on each of these. First of all, within careers, um, many of you may know that in North America, there has long been a movement called the alt ac And this has largely been something that's developed within the digital humanities. So you have these wonderful integrative people who end up having careers that are off the beaten path, to put it in a good way. Um, perhaps without a set career track would be perhaps the negative side of things. We don't really have an equivalent in the EU. I think because we have much more um, uh, government uh, relationship with the institutions, we haven't seen the same kind of movement arise. However, as the infrastructure is starting to develop, as we're seeing more and more emphasis on things like um, data stewardship and data management, and also the, the need for that integration, the need for people who stand between these various um, points of the dialogue that brings together not just the digital humanities, but at the large scale, the humanities research infrastructure. Um, we're also seeing these new kinds of career paths emerging. So, and if you think back to some of the definitions of research infrastructure, almost everyone will say something about people, about human resources being important. Uh, so how do we support these people? Now there are projects like RI Train and the Edison Project, which I would encourage you to look up. Um, whether or not these are the answers, I don't know, because again, they're trying to train across research infrastructure, so whether or not they work for us. And also, it doesn't necessarily answer the question, which has always been at the core of the alt Act movement, of how you make that career path rewarding in its own right, how you make sure that these people who often trained as researchers have access to a way to share their knowledge, even if they're not on a pure research path anymore, or alternatively, if they change, for example, in library science, how they have access into that community. So, this goes back to some of the things that we talk about in some of the other lectures about, for example, object versus social orientations and epistemic agency. It also talks about 
uh, psychological contracts, what people expect from their career, what they expect from their employer, when they get really excited about something and they start leading a project, whether or not they will actually then be supported to actually lead that project to completion, or whether it will be seen that at some point they're, they're crossing a boundary where a different kind of person needs to take over because perhaps their career path isn't as defined. Um, there are good attempts being made to try and define these kinds of hybrid career paths. This is just an example from the Health Research Board in Ireland that I find quite interesting because it moves through the formal training but also in the clinical training, which I think may have a bit of an equivalency to some of the lab work or some of the applied work that we do in the digital humanities. So I think being aware of career paths is really important. And when I step over to my, my second key issue for the, the second half of this, this lecture, which is open science, it's quite interesting that career paths are a part of this agenda as well. Making sure that people have, have been given the opportunity to train for openness and that they're able to move forward with their careers regardless of what barriers there may seem to be. So this open science policy platform, however, has quite far-reaching impact on humanities research infrastructure. The idea of fair open data, findable, uh, usable, reusable, interoperable data, um, I think is something we would all agree with. But from a humanist point of view, knowing that much of our data is paradata, much of our data is intricately linked to source material that we may not be allowed to share, that we may have paid money to a cultural heritage institution to image, that we may have signed a waiver or signed a form, a copyright form on, to say we would not share it again. In those instances, the idea of open sharing of data becomes quite threatening because if that becomes a requirement that we can't live up to, then we are in, in very big trouble indeed. So working as a research infrastructure to try and, and manage these sorts of issues. Um, the Open Science Cloud, which I'll talk a bit more in a second, is another one of these massive infrastructure projects. And how does that fit in with the disciplinary norms and the differences between us? Um, altmetrics, well, I don't even know if we have the, the, the publishing models in place yet, which is the, the next item, much less the way of measuring, well, what is the difference between a publication having an impact in an open science journal as opposed to a publication that is in a more traditional journal, but where there may not be that openness, where there may be a much stricter release policy. Um, rewards, research integrity, open science skills, these are where we get into those questions of careers. And finally, citizen science. It may well be that digital humanities has an excellent way of connecting with citizen science. Put wonderful historical documents on the internet and people will find them and people will use them. At the same time as a research infrastructure, does that dilute the mission of serving the expert researcher to serving that frontier research rather than necessarily serving something in an environment where anyone without a lot of training and research might be able to use these, these assets. So there's a lot of questions around the infrastructural place in the Open Science Policy Platform, and this is very much developing policy as I, as I speak to you now. Quick word on that Open Science Cloud, as I mentioned, um, this is meant to be the sort of infrastructure of infrastructures. And the one thing I find really interesting about it though, and actually quite comforting, is that this is the same model that we're looking at in other forms of research infrastructure. Because what you have is you have a data layer, something rich and thick at the bottom where all this information can come together. And then at the top you have the services, you have the tools, the things that you'll use to interrogate that bottom layer. And in the middle you have an exchange layer. So we're still working towards the place where the, the, the exchange layers, the, the kind of the APIs that you see in the best of the cultural heritage institutions are more widespread, but it is definitely something that we can see uh, forecast and that will become ever stronger if the models like the Open Science Cloud catch on. So finally, if I do see that there's a lot of responsibility and a lot of perhaps um, challenge in the environment around uh, the policies and the politics of a research infrastructure, I do see a lot of hope as well. Because once we begin to develop at scale, if we do it right, we'll see the ability for people to access digital methods that they would not have had before. 
rather than having to have your own big grant, maybe you can work from the big grants of others. Maybe you can use the tools. Maybe you can use the, the data that's been collected by others. Maybe we really will get to the point where we can better reuse the assets of research and democratize these methods. Um, I think research infrastructures need to support debate, debate as well as development. We're always rushing forward. How do we make sure that there's a critical eye in there as well so that we don't end up building things that we don't end up using? Um, I think we need to find ways to support those new career structures where the Alt-Ac can consolidate a voice. I think we also need to use the reach and the breadth of research infrastructure to advocate for our disciplines, our methods, and for the interests of our long-standing partners, the cultural heritage institutions. Our research infrastructure will not look like CERN. Our research infrastructure will not look like a, a, a high-energy light source. It's going to look different, and we need to make sure that we know what we need so that we can make sure that our disciplines get what they need. And finally, as someone who's worked for many, many years in a traditional research institute, the beautiful building you see around me, I have often heard said that one of the problems with managing the research of the humanists is that they don't speak with a single voice. And I think that that's a part of our tradition as well. And I think that's a part of our strength as well. But where our interests do come together in the development of new publication policies, in the development of new restrictions on what we can or can't release for our data, and the development of new career paths, I think there's a real opportunity for us to speak with a single voice through the infrastructures, not about everything, but about those things that bring us together. At its best, the research infrastructure will be able to do that, to bring the bottom together and to make it possible for us to access that top level and strengthen our disciplines and strengthen all of our work.